Hi, I'm Pete Schwartz, and I'm going to describe parallel pedagogy and how it works for us. My name is Owen Stabland, and I'll be talking about how in our upcoming publication, we show that parallel pedagogy improves students' concept application. Hi, my name is Jennifer Clay, and I'm going to tell you about my experience adopting parallel pedagogy for the first time. And then we'll tell you about the resources we have, because we want you to adopt parallel pedagogy. We think most instructors would agree the best way to go about solving problems is by identifying and developing the underlying concepts. And yet we think that most classes train students to formula hunt because we teach the concepts one at a time and we grade the students on the answer and we count their homework toward their final grade. Thus, in optimizing their time, students will often strategically bypass the conceptual development in favor of finding the formula, putting the numbers in, and getting the answer. And so how do we do it differently? If we really value concept development, we would introduce the concepts simultaneously, conservation of momentum, energy, dynamics, and motion, and then we build in the complexity reviewing the concepts with every additional step. Homework doesn't count toward the final grade. We use weekly assessments and we grade largely on conceptual development. So when students do the homework, they're not just trying to get an answer, they're trying to learn the material. This is a rough model of a 10-week curriculum. I draw your attention to week 10. This is when we introduce trigonometry and these two kinematic formulas that students often use without fully understanding them. And so at the very beginning, we introduce the four concepts with no math, trig, or vectors. And then in the subsequent weeks, we develop the one-dimensional vectors initially, units, and we use examples of springs, friction, and ballistic pendulum, which is extra cool because it has two concepts involved, conservation of energy and momentum in a collision. And we have them do a video project. The students take a video of themselves doing something strenuous so they can use the video to get the kinematics and calculate the power. So for instance, we want to throw a heavy ball into the air. Software can extract the position versus time data, and from this we can calculate the velocity and the acceleration. From the velocity, we can calculate the kinetic energy, and from the position, we can calculate the potential energy. We can add these two together to get the total mechanical energy of the system, and what we see is when the ball is in the air, the total energy is largely constant, but at a lower level for each subsequent bounce. Work is done on the system when he's throwing it into the air. And so the power is going to be the slope of this line, where we see the ball gains approximately 100 joules of energy in half a second for a power of approximately 200 watts. And we can analyze the forces with a free body diagram. After covering mechanics in one dimension in the first two weeks, we repeat the same process for rotations. And in week five, we look at central forces, including centripetal acceleration and universal gravity. In six, we can look at systems of masses. In weeks seven and eight, we repeat the analysis again, but for two dimensions, but without trigonometry, so students get an idea of how to visually estimate components. In week nine, we look at more advanced topics, like precession and gyroscopic stabilization. And in week 10, we draw it all together and allow students to use trigonometry and to use these larger kinematic formulas. So how do we grade on conceptual development? For instance, the example of a car coming around an off-ramp on a slippery road. A student may remember the formula, put the numbers in, and get the correct answer. For our assessments, this would earn them an F. However, if they first identify this is a dynamics problem because forces are causing acceleration, they would get a D. And if they recognize this acceleration was centripetal acceleration oriented inward, and this acceleration is a result of the sum of the forces, subsequently identifying the forces in a free body diagram, and adding them to get the result in force, they would get a C because it's in the wrong direction. But if they furthermore recognized the acceleration must be in the same direction as the sum of the forces, they would get a B. Lastly, if they were able to estimate what the sum of the forces were and substitute in the right values to get the correct answer, they would get an A. We have constant feedback with short weekly assessments that allow students to check on their progress and allow us to grade the assessments before the next class period, providing quick feedback. 
So I'll be talking about the study from our upcoming publication, Pedagogy Changes and Improved Concept Application where we sought to compare parallel pedagogy classes with the standard pedagogy classes on a well-documented problem. Over a thousand Cal Poly students tried to solve this problem for credit on either a final exam or in-class quiz at the end of the term. So here is the test problem we use. Two carts of different masses are pushed by equal forces until they reach the line. Students compare the cart's initial accelerations kinetic energies when they reach the line, and momenta when they reach the line. Crucially, students have to explain their reasoning. In line with previous studies, students struggled significantly with parts B and C. Part B requires a one-step application of the work energy theorem to show that the kinetic energies are equal when they reach the line. Part C requires an application of the impulse momentum theorem to show that the more massive cart, which takes longer, gains more momentum. Only about one-third of students in calculus-based mechanics classes answered Part B correctly, and only about a quarter answered Part C correctly. Algebra-based classes did less than half as well. Students who got this wrong often would write out the formula for kinetic energy or momentum and try to use compensatory reasoning to explain what the answer is, such as one cart has a higher velocity and velocity is squared in the kinetic energy formula, so that cart must have greater kinetic energy. So as you can see on these graphs, the students in the parallel pedagogy classes performed significantly better than the conventional pedagogy students on both parts B and C. And if we take a look at the algebra-based classes, we can see that the same trend follows. We do acknowledge, however, that because only one section of an algebra-based parallel pedagogy class was evaluated here, that we cannot determine that the higher scores weren't simply because of the professor or other anomalous statistics of the class. There's another disclaimer, Owen. The improved performance in the parallel pedagogy classes may be attributed to the learning assistants who are not present in the conventional classes. Pollock's study reports enhanced results from tutorials with learning assistants, with the best results by the learning assistants themselves. While Pollock's study invoked learning assistants differently than we did, we acknowledge that learning assistants in the parallel pedagogy classes may share credit for the enhanced performance. If you check out our upcoming publication in The Physics Teacher, you can find more in-depth discussion of potential problems with how we teach conservation laws, an intervention we tried to improve this, and more. When I first introduced parallel pedagogy in 2017 via the physics teacher, I included CLAS results consistent with enhanced concept application. The CLAS, or Colorado Learning Attitudes About Science Survey, developed at University of Colorado Boulder, measures the agreement between student perspectives and the perspectives of expert physicists. For instance, in physics, it is important for me to make sense out of formulas before I can use them correctly. This is a favorable statement, and the agreement to this statement is graphed on the y-axis. The survey is given before and after the class, so we expect to see a positive shift from before to after. Similarly, we hope to see a negative shift in agreement with unfavorable statements, which we graph on the x-axis. An example is a significant problem in learning physics is being able to memorize all the information I need to know. Thus, a shift toward expert thinking is going to be up and to the left. Unfortunately, Adams found that most introductory physics classes result in a negative shift. So we were pleased to find that the survey results for our class had an overall positive shift. There were also positive shifts in problem solving ability, but the largest shift is in applied conceptual understanding. So maybe this should not surprise us. Parallel pedagogy begins with concept identification, prioritizes concept development, and grades the student on building answers from a conceptual foundation. We might expect parallel pedagogy to enhance student ability to
to identify and apply concepts. How about computation? Does emphasis on concepts compromise computation ability? Well, we think no. Actually, just the opposite. More on that later. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about my experience adopting parallel pedagogy for the first time. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that the materials that Pete developed, the, the videos and the textbook uh, that he's been using in hybrid instruction for many years, uh, made it actually really easy for me to jump right in and uh, get going with this uh, curriculum. I was able to focus on class time interactions and helping students develop their learning community with each other and uh, through their discussions and thinking about these four concepts in parallel, help them develop their expert level thinking. And that's really what drew me to the curriculum in the first place was the fact that by teaching the four concepts in parallel, we really encourage students to focus on the problem they want to solve. And this is more like what we do in our work and also uh, how we experience problems that come up in our everyday lives. So by training them to look at the problem through these four lenses and justify their choice, they learn to think like experts. When we talk about uh, how this curriculum works, a question that comes up a lot of times is whether or not we have to sacrifice our uh, computational rigor in favor of the conceptual framing that we, we tend to focus on. And I wanna uh, definitively answer that with a resounding no. Uh, the students actually do a lot of computations, almost every problem that we assign, whether it's in the textbook or on the weekly assessments, includes a numerical computation that they have to do after they figured out what concept to apply and how it relates to the problem they're solving. And then after they uh, uh, come up with a numerical answer, we ask them to evaluate its validity uh, in order to earn an A on their weekly assessments. So the computational rigor is there um, and it is uh, bolstered by the foundation of the conceptual understanding that they develop by thinking through these four lenses. Here we see a slide from Dr. Eric Mazur's lecture, Confessions of a Converted Lecturer. The plot points represent an individual student's performance on a conceptual problem in the y direction, plotted against their performance on a conventional problem in the x direction. As you can see, the upper left-hand corner is unpopulated, which means that there weren't students who did well on a conceptual problem that didn't do well on a conventional problem. The implication then is that understanding the concepts leads to good problem solving. We have all the resources that you need to get started. We have a free online textbook, conceptual, algebra-based, and calculus-based, and you can assign them via perusal if you want to monitor the participation. We also have about 100 YouTube videos that you can have the students watch through PlayPosit, a web platform that allows the students to watch the videos while you ask them questions and record their participation. This is how a student would view one of our videos through PlayPosit. I ask about one question every minute. PlayPosit records the answers. I myself don't grade the correctness of the question, just that the student answers all the questions. We also see that if I lock the gyroscope by tying it with strings, preventing it from changing orientation, it's very easy to turn again. Number one's not right, but number two is correct. So I submit, oh, I forgot. Number three is also correct, that if I cut the strings... Also, you have access to past classes that we've had with all the exams, solutions, etc., and you can join our learning community. For instance, Dean Stoker is a professor at Blue Ash College in the University of Cincinnati. He adopted parallel pedagogy and found it was a smooth transition, improved student learning, and it was enjoyable. Furthermore, his class was conceptual physics, so he adopted the parallel pedagogy to a conceptual program and wrote his own textbook, which we also provide. This past year with COVID, uh, and the pandemic has obviously been hard on all of us and going fully online with any course is always challenging. But I wanna say again, that thanks to the wealth of videos and online activities that were created uh, for this curriculum, 
that adapting it to the online environment was actually easier than uh, many other courses I had to teach. Um, the hardest part, I think, of any online course is keeping students engaged and interacting with each other throughout the quarter. Uh, but with lessons learned from the pandemic, we are working on rolling out a, a full Canvas course shell for both asynchronous and asynchronous online instruction that integrates best practices for online engagement. Uh, using universal design for learning, we are working on developing uh, fully universally accessible materials and also uh, keeping uh, our focus on the student so that the, the learning experience is student centered. And I think uh, we are looking for uh, uh, collaborators or anyone interested in joining our learning community to help us build more of these kinds of materials together. So in conclusion, we think parallel pedagogy is a better way to learn mechanics. Uh, plus, it's a lot of fun to teach. And the student surveys indicate that most of the students like this way better than a series method. And students apply concepts better rather than formula hunting. And they think more like experts, as indicated by the CLAS. And adopting parallel pedagogy for yourself is actually really easy to do because all of the materials are freely available online and we hope that you will take a look at them and, and tell us what you think. And moving forward, we're going to continue to develop these resources and we would like you to join our learning community so that you can also contribute and you can also benefit from having these resources. Just contact us as soon as you'd like to get involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. That was, that was <laughs>